All right, Acts chapter number 27. Acts chapter 27. Thanks for being in church tonight. And uh, we'll get uh, right into it. Acts chapter number 27. Grateful for the spirit of your church. Always enjoy being around uh, uh, people of God who uh, enjoy their salvation and have a good spirit. And I certainly appreciate that. That still seems just to be a little feedback up here, brother. I don't know how it is out there as if it sounds strange to you guys. Acts chapter number 27. Thank you, brother Mike. And uh, Acts chapter 27. Look at verse number 9 with me, if you would, uh, please. Verse number 9. Debated and tossed two or three messages back and forth tonight. Usually when you get four or five messages into a meeting like this, you know, you just, it gets a, you know, you're starting to think, okay, now you're honing in on, on messages because you know you have a few left. Amen, number one. Number two is, is that uh, you're certainly not trying to be redundant and give uh, uh, something that the Lord wants and something fresh. So I'll pray the Lord helps us tonight. Look at Acts chapter 27, verse number nine. And this is Paul, of course, as he is on his journey to Rome. He has been taken captive as a prisoner and uh, he now is on the ship and he's sailing uh, with uh, other uh, prisoners but they're also on a ship that uh, has cargo on it and uh, the master of the ship the man who owns the ship is trying to make a dollar trying to make money here and uh, so there's some multiple things that are going on I don't want you just kind of have that in your mind if you will there's multiple things that are going on that are taking place simultaneously but remember inside of every journey, okay, every journey, when God's man is in the center of that or one of God's people is in the center of that, you, whatever your life is, there's things going on around your life. But the interest that God has is his people. Is everybody with that? His people. So whatever's taking place in the world, God's interest in the world is with his people. And then the ministry of his people, who they minister to. And so uh, we uh, just have that in mind as we look at this. Now when uh, much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading and ship, but also of our lives. And so he mentions the cargo or the lading of the ship, but he also speaks about it is that, that people, the people of the ship could get hurt. And uh, so notice verse 11, nevertheless the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was now not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocliden, and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven." And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Uh, tonight for your Bible, and it's so precious. And we thank you for uh, this passage of Scripture tonight specifically. And I, I pray, 
Holy Spirit, that you would help us as we draw nigh to this passage of Scripture, uh, that you would lead the way, and uh, that you would draw from the, this passage of Scripture, and some others we'll look at, Lord, as you have prepared. Uh, Lord, focusing on tonight, Lord, not so much what I say, but what you say. And uh, Lord, uh, the, uh, the tailor fitting of the message that you will do in each and every heart now, people have come out on a Monday night, God, and they came to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you would help keep me out of the way in all ways, at all times. And Lord, that you would be the center of our attention and that our mind would be upon not only this passage, but be upon revival. And uh, Lord, be upon, uh, Lord, eternal things. And Lord, that you would just take these things and that you would put it all together and have it to make sense in accordance with what you're doing in each and every life. Lord, we want souls to be saved and lives to be changed. Lord, I pray that that would be something that would be before us as we consider your book and your mission that you've given to us. Now help us, please, Father, to say what we need to hear and would we give you the glory for it. We love you. Help us to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take your attention back to verse number 12. This will be our text verse for tonight. And as I say, we'll look at some other passages of Scripture, but I just want this to be in your mind. Notice, and because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice. And there to winter, which is in haven of Crete, lying toward the south, West and Northwest. The general consensus of the majority opinion was to uh, go away from this island, to eliminate this island from consideration. As they're looking to figure out where they are going to winter, uh, when they got there and they saw this particular island, uh, the consensus was not here. Let's go away from this place. Uh, this place is not commodious. Uh, this, uh, this word is an interesting word. It, it means convenient, means suitable, uh, fit, proper, adapted to its use or purpose or to wants and necessities. Commodious. The haven was not commodious to winter in. And I, I'm not sure exactly what it was lacking, but it was lacking something as far as they were concerned. And they summed it up. Perhaps uh, we could say that the accommodations were not suitable. They weren't comfortable there. And so uh, as they saw it, it wasn't a place that they wanted to spend the winter. And perhaps it offered less than they were accustomed to having. Uh, maybe there wasn't enough supply for everyone on the ship. Uh, you know, there weren't uh, maybe some enough restaurants in town or there weren't enough... Uh, uh, places to stay and, and uh, all of these things are on their mind. Either way, the bottom line is, is that they determined that it wasn't a convenient place to stay for the winter. And uh, they went beyond a uh, safe place to winter in search of convenience. Because here they're safe. And that's what Paul's trying to express and he's trying to explain to them. Look, uh, we, we're here. The ship is off the, off the high seas and the storms and all that. We're away from that. We're already here. Let's go on land, no matter what it is. But the idea for them, they had their minds on something of convenience. Uh, they, they were willing to take a risk uh, if it meant that they were going to go to a more commodious place, a place that was more convenient, more suitable. And so it was summed up by saying that it was not commodious. Now, once upon a time, there was an elderly lady in, in our church. You, were ta you and I were talking about her, Brother uh, uh, Erica Schultz. Erica Schultz, when I pastored, was a, a, a lady uh, that was an old German lady. She'd gone to a German Bas Baptist church, and, and uh, when her church kind of closed up its doors, uh, we happened to knock upon her door one day, and and uh, she came to visit our church and she never left. She just loved it. 
She had grown up as an orphan in Germany during World War II. She was, uh, had a great fondness for the Jewish people, and so much so that uh, we often suspected that she might have been Jewish. She didn't know who her parents what, were, and she grew up in an orphanage, so we suspected, well, maybe she was a Jew. And all she knew is that she grew up in an orphanage in Germany during World War II. She doesn't know who her parents were. She is now in a different church, a church uh, that I'm familiar with. Uh, she started going to a different church, another place. In fact, she moved out of that state that she was in where I pastored. And she goes to this other, uh, other church in another state. They had found out about her. One of my brothers used to pastor that church. And she winds up going to uh, that particular church. And she's a widow woman, she's without any children, she doesn't have anybody to take care of, so the people in that particular church are responsible for taking care of her because she's a true widow. And they look in on her throughout the week, and they provide meals for her, they take her shopping, uh, they wash her clothes, uh, she goes over to their homes on special events, at special times, she goes over for lunch on Sunday afternoons, and she's cared for and she's loved by these people in that church. However, the older she gets, she gets more difficult to care for. She now is seen, if you will, by a growing number of people who have cared for her as being bothersome at times. She's become more difficult. Those who are caretakers who have made themselves responsible for the well-being of this particular woman are now considering alternative care for her. They feel that she uh, needs a solution to a problem that she's become increasingly difficult and hard to manage, Miss Erica. She's become quite difficult and burdens, burdensome to those people who have sacrificed and they've given and uh, they have cared for her and waited on her hand and foot, but she's contrary. Uh, she doesn't seem to appreciate it. She's not very easy to love, and she complicates the issue by saying things that are not kind to them. She says uh, uh, to those that bring her food, and I don't like this, and I don't want this, and uh, things that she's eaten before, and all of that, and it seems like maybe there's something maybe even going with her mind, they don't know. She doesn't appreciate things like uh, she did before, and she's not very nice to her caretakers, and She's a widow there in the church, and they certainly have a compulsion. They have a certain obligation to care for her, but the relationship has become very strained. They're tired of doing for her because she's difficult, and she's unappreciative of the care that they have shown to her. She's not helping her cause. She's turning away those who have come to help her. And somebody called me one day and said, what do we do? What should they do? The Bible says here in verse number 12, because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence. It wasn't a, a commodious place to winter. It was inconvenient. The conditions were not suitable to winter there in that place. So they sought for a place. They said, we'll put this place in our rear view mirror. We're going to go on to some other place. They took up the anchor, they left the safety behind of that particular place, and they set sail for a more uh, advantageous place to winter in. A place, uh, the place that was uh, inconvenient as a, a winter haven, according to them, is something that they wanted to leave. Incommodious, unsuitable, disadvantageous, giving trouble or uneasiness, increasing the difficulty of progress or success unfit and unsuitable. And if you sat down and you thought for just a minute or two tonight, I would imagine that it would not take you very long to come up with a short list of things which you might would divide, decide, uh, decide are inconvenient in your life. Things that happen to us in this life that we would determine to be inconvenient. Uh, they're unfit things. They're unstable things. These troublesome things, if you will, are, are disruptive and they interfere with the peacefulness and the comfort and the serenity of our lives. Hence, uh, we look at them as being inconvenient things and we try to be done with them as quickly as we can. We hope or we seek to try to eliminate things from our life in some way very quickly. 
The word elimination in Noah's Webster's 1828 dictionary says the act of expelling or throwing off, the act of discharging or secreting by the pores, which is an interesting way to state it. The definition contains some very interesting and and, uh, very graphic imagery of discharging something that's foreign and not wanted as it becomes infected. The body has a process of working hard to push out or to eliminate anything that becomes unwelcome. You could certainly think about uh, a splinter tonight, that if you get a splinter uh, from a piece of wood, uh, it doesn't belong there. It's foreign, and over a period of time, what's going to happen? If you don't dig it out, guess what? Over time, it will push it out. It wants to get rid of it because it'll fester, and it will discharge, eliminating what we don't, do not want. It seems to be the mindset of most people when it comes to problematic things or bothersome things, those things that come our way which are troublesome or inconvenient to us, things that we want to eliminate from our life. I want you to hold your place there, if you would, and go with me to John chapter number 12, please. John chapter number 12. Let's look at another passage of Scripture. Perhaps we, we do so, uh, this idea of getting rid of something, we do so uh, not considering uh, or not taking consideration for what it means to our life. How about people or places of things that require more time and more effort? We work to remove, if you will, or, or process things out of our life for the most part without first properly evaluating why we're facing what we're facing in the per- first place. We work to eliminate a troublesome or bothersome or burdensome problematic things without honestly considering what value they have in our life or what purpose they might be in our life in the first place. Can a problem be a help to us? Remember, in one sense, Jesus troubled himself when he humbled himself and he became a man so that he could come down here and he could save you and I. Might the Lord help our thinking along these lines tonight? What benefit is such troubling things to us? You could think about tonight, you could think about uh, David's life as David is on the run from Saul. For seven years, he's on the run from Saul. And even at one point in time, his guys say, look, uh, he's in the cave, he's asleep. Uh, Here's the perfect time. God hath presented this opportunity for you to get rid of your enemy. And David certainly had some reservation about that. So what did he do? He just cut the skirt. And when he cut the skirt, it was almost like testing the waters to see if God was really with this. And what happened? God smote his heart. And David instantly realized this is not of God. This is not what God wants. No matter what the brethren say, it's not for me to eliminate Saul from my life. And he couldn't see it at the time, but God was preparing a man to be a man after his own heart. He didn't understand it all, but there was a preparation being done. Through the uh, lean times, through the weak times, through the inconvenient times. It wasn't commodious. Well, he was on the run. Notice, if you will... Uh, We talked about this passage a little bit, talked about this story, uh, so we won't go too far into it, but just kind of show you again. Look at chapter 12 here. Uh, Here's Jesus, uh, verse number 1, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikemart very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Notice, if you will, verse 9, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. 
The breaking of the alabaster box of ointment brought up conversation. Certainly Simon, as we talked about uh, yesterday, jumped to his own conclusions right away. And then, uh, then he would have preferred to eliminate this woman. Why is she here in my house? And why is this taking place? Inconvenient, if you will. And Simon uh, uh, looked at her as being one that messed up the fellowship that was taking place. Why? Because he didn't understand it. And to the disciples, her work was seen as a waste. His statement about being a, uh, to them about being a good work was in direct conflict with what their thinking was at this time. What she did was seen as obviously to them as troublesome, bothersome. She's in the way. And they made their conclusions about that and seeing it that it was wasteful. They couldn't see the benefit of it. However, after further examination, after Jesus makes some comments to them, after Jesus reveals why she's doing what she's doing, they realize that their thinking is wrong. It's opposite of what the Lord Jesus Christ thinking is. But at the time, they're looking, she, uh, she's inconvenient, she's in the way, she doesn't belong here, why is she here? She's messing up the fellowship. It's because they couldn't see the spiritual that was taking place. Couldn't see why she would be needed at such a time. And I would have you to notice also with regards to Lazarus, notice that it bothered the Pharisee much, Pharisees so much, they wanted to kill a guy who had already been dead and brought back to life. If these men were more open to not knowing than they were knowing, they would have done better at discerning her act upon Christ. What is this for? Be careful not to send away the benefits of God's work in your life. We often, so many times, do so, if you will, as we reject something that we should be embracing. Look at 2 Corinthians with that thought in mind. 2 Corinthians. Are we eliminating inconvenient things? 2 Corinthians in chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians in chapter number 12, a familiar story to us. About a mercy, a, 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 a thorn that had no mercy. Notice, if you will, verse number seven in this passage of Scripture. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Notice, if you will, this uh, thorn that was without mercy. Notice that it lacked compassion. To Paul, it was therefore unwelcomed. It was unwanted in his life. It was unneeded. I don't need this. So Paul prayed and he asked God to take it away from him once, twice, three times. Eliminate this from me. And that was the obvious answer to him. Something that's bothersome, something that is, a, that is a pain, something that is a sickness, something that is an ill, something that is some type of trouble that we might be facing. The obvious solution to us is get rid of this. It's just a bother to us. I don't want this in my life. I want to get rid of this just as quickly as I can. If we carry on with that thought further, I'm sure that as he prayed, the obvious conclusion to him would have been that he would find that God would be an ally in removing this from him. As I pray, I know God is going to uh, try to help me. He doesn't want me to be in pain. He doesn't want me to suffer. He doesn't want, I'm serving him. I'm helping in the cause of Christ. He's going he's to help me. He's going to be an ally to me and we're going to work together. He's going to take this thorn away from me. A caring, a loving God who says, cast all your care upon me for I care for you. No doubt will be understanding. No doubt will be helpful to eliminate a thorn and a pain from my life. It, it, it's complicating my life. I, I think I can serve better, uh, God better if He removes this from my life, right? Yet a benotes to Paul, the thorn in the flesh served a very valuable purpose. 
But without knowing the benefit and the value of the painful thorn, he sought God to remove it. Lord, please rid me of this. It pains me. It troubles me. I don't want this. Please eliminate it from my life. No. It serves a purpose. 2 Kings chapter 6. It serves a purpose in my life. Oh, that we might see the value of inconvenient things. 2 Kings in chapter number 6. Notice with me, please, verse number 13. Now, just to quickly set this up, we have the, uh, the king here that comes up against uh, Israel, wanting to, uh, the king of Syria wanting to war against Israel. They take counsel together to do this, and yet uh, Elisha the prophet gets involved in this and it tells uh, where they're at, what their battle plans, their strategy and all of that messes up their plans. And so then the king decides he wants to go down and get Elisha the prophet. So uh, he takes off with his army and goes down to Elisha's house, surrounding the house. Well, that'd be a fearful sight if you looked out your front window and saw the army of the Syrians. Come on now. And all you got your prophet that's, or your assistant to the prophet that's with you. Don't even have a musket in the house. Somebody say Amen. And he said, go and spy where he is, verse 13, that I may send and fetch him. Uh, and it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? Notice the terror in his voice. Notice he's scared. Notice he probably trembled at the sight of seeing all of that. Notice verse 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and of fire round about Elisha. Notice, and uh, when, he, uh, when they came to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, uh, I pray thee with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Notice the fear in his voice. The anxiousness. Come on now. And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. Of course, they're going to eat, they're going to drink, and they're going to go back to their master. The question that faced them, notice, how can we eliminate this problem that's at our front door? As he's looking out, that's basically what he's asking when he asks the question. I mean, no one wants trouble at their front door. Come on now. And here they've got this unwanted trouble, this visitor that's come that's not welcome at their front door. But while the prophet's assistant, if you will, sought to eliminate the intruders that are in the front yard, Elisha asked God to open his eyes so that he could see what he could not see. He wasn't worried about uh, the people, the uh, the problem in the front yard, he was more concerned about his young prophet. He was concerned that he couldn't see. Because uh, uh, Elisha understood the real problem that needed to removal, if you will, was not outside. The real problem that needed removal was on the inside. It was the view of his assistant. If he's going to be traveling with him, he needed to be able to see right. The army outside would help him to see better as his eyes were open. 
With God opening his spiritual eyes, his view would be enhanced. The perceived problem in the foreground would be eclipsed by the answer in the background. The army of God that they could not see. I I like this story because in this particular story, uh, you notice that the prophet, when he hears about it, he doesn't run to the window. Now you and I are prone to run to the window. Come on now. Daddy, you're not going to believe this. Come out of here. Look, look, look. Come on now. He didn't go to the window. He went to pray. He wasn't interested in putting his eyes on the trouble. He was interested in his young assistant putting his eyes on God. Without the problem standing in the front yard confronting his priest challenging his comfort. Uh, The assistant would not have known that he could not see what he needed to see. Without the problems in our life, many times we're unaware of the fact that we can't see what we can't see. And so we look at something like that and it's inconvenient for us and we want it removed right away. But as his eyes were opened and the answer came into view, the assistant was given the abundance of peace. And it was the same thing with Paul with regards to his throne, uh, his uh, throne, uh, thorn, uh, thorn. I'll get it right in a minute. It was given to help him to be able to see better. The danger was that without the thorn, uh, his vision that he had been given about God and the things of God in pride could be taken away from him. You realize pride can uh, give you bad eyesight? This helped him to see better. Or helped him to maintain good sight. It was to keep his eyes lifted up uh, toward God and not exalted above measure. And God tells him that, helps him to understand that, that that was the purpose of it. Therefore, the issue at hand was acceptance, not elimination. Agreement so that uh, two could walk together and not be interrupted. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And the answer is no, they can't. And God doesn't want that walk to be interrupted. God doesn't want us to be disrupted in our walk with Him because our peace is taken away. He wants us to be able to see right. And in the end, He did. He accepted the thorn. He accepted it as being valuable for His life. Look at 2 Timothy in chapter number 2 with me, please. The ministry of the thorn. Don't eliminate it. Embrace it. Elimination was the first thought. And that's often the case. When something bothers us, when something troubles us, the first thing we want to do is eliminate it. We want to get rid of it. We don't like it bothering us. We don't like it causing problems in our life. And we often seek to remove and eliminate the troubling things without first considering the purpose that it's been given to accomplish in our life. Why is this here? Remember yesterday's message? Being spiritually curious. Why is this here? Why has God given me this? What is it I'm supposed to see here? How is this going to enhance my walk with Him? That's not our first thought. Our first thought is, get rid of this thing. This is troublesome. I don't like the problems. Anybody like problems? 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I think sometimes we forget we've been chosen to be soldiers. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say... And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Look with me please at the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth in chapter number 1. Eliminating things that we don't want. Not realizing that there's benefit in hardships. Hardships come in many different forms. Which usually seem inescapable. None of them seem joyous. Joy is not the door greeter of your heart when hardships come. Grief and sorrow and mourning usually are. It's not likely that we get a pen and we get a piece of paper and we start taking notes and learning from our heartaches like we ought to. No, we usually resist first. 
We try to eliminate first. We don't put out the welcome mat for troubles. We don't look at them and say, well, this is going to help my life. This is going to benefit me. Maybe somewhere in the process we finally realize that we've got to, we've got to get on board with it. Maybe we come to it, but not at the outset. That seems to be the answer to all of our troubles and the bothersome things. Get rid of this. I don't want this heartache. I don't want this hardship. Has hardship been sent with benefits? What if hardship comes with a big basket of benefits? When facing troubles, we must learn to endure the hardness as a good soldier. To serve us as we serve in the ministry. The troubles can serve to strengthen us and, 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 and to enable us in ways that we couldn't otherwise be enabled. Sorrows serve as a caretaker designed not to destroy us, but to carry us to the next milestone. A ministry of hope to us. Notice, if you will, this passage of Scripture with that thought in mind. I remember hearing this years ago, and what a preacher said in regards to this is he started talking about the idea that Naomi told Ruth to go back. He said he was just wise in telling her to do that because he said he really wanted her to be committed to the way. I got reading this story, and I found out that ain't true. She sent her back because she didn't want her. She didn't want the ministry of Ruth. She bothered her. She, she's bitter. She's upset that God has done all these things in her life and she can't understand why and she doesn't want Ruth being a reminder to her. Well, get rid of her. I don't want her around. I don't want Orpha. I don't want Ruth. Get rid of these girls. Notice in verse number 6, she arose with her daughters-in-law. They might return from the country of Moab. She had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited His people and given them bread. And so they set out on this journey and she's trying to convince these two girls that they need to go back. Notice verse number 8. Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her, her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? And she's going to give them all these reasons why they don't need to go with them. Verse number 14, And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Orpha's going to go back, but Ruth isn't leaving. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if all but death part thee and me. And when she saw not when she heard, but when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. What happened? Well, she goes out on that first day, and what she start to do? She starts to glean. Notice verse number 18 of chapter 2. She took it up. She went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? This is a whole lot. Come on now. And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And, and Naomi said unto uh, her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord. Notice now she's getting excited about this thing. She's bitter and she's down and out and she's depressed and she's discouraged and she don't want no daughter-in-law to have to minister to. And now her daughter-in-law is ministering to her. The thing that she saw was burdensome now has become a blessing. The thing that she saw was a problem has now become a prize. And everything now is looking just a little bit different to her. Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And she's going to go on and she's going to encourage her daughter-in-law. 
Uh, see, at first she didn't want the responsibility of these two young ladies. As far as she was concerned, she'd gone through enough trouble already. She didn't want anything to do with them complicating her lives. I don't want any more sorrow. I don't want any more har hardship. Uh, you remind me, ladies. You remind me. You're heavy baggage. I don't want to have to tote you all the way back to Bethlehem, Judah. So she sought to, in, uh, to eliminate something to her that was inconvenient. I don't want this ministry. You ever thought to eliminate ministry from your life? You ever got a little bit bitter against God, perhaps, like she was, and you didn't want ministry anymore? Why is ministry the first thing to go? Well, I'll come back to church whenever I get everything straightened out. No, no, church is the place to help you get things straightened out. Come on now, people. But notice how that's always, the place of help always is the first thing people want to eliminate from their life. Somebody starts to have a little bit of trouble in their life and what do they want to do? Eliminate their Sunday school class. Your Sunday school class is helping you in ways that you don't even realize. Your, your Sunday school class, those little kids are a blessing to you. They feed you every week. Even as you think you're a blessing to them, they're a blessing to you. Remember the first time I went to the Philippines to go on a mission trip and I'm ready to be a blessing to those people. Say amen. You know, you're going out, you're going to be a blessing to those people. I came back and I go, man, them people are a blessing to me. Come on now. God has made it so that ministry is the blessing. And she wants to eliminate the ministry that God's given her. He's given her these two ladies that she can minister to. Yes, they've all been through heartache, but they can share in the, in the joys of God back down at Bethlehem, Judah. Go back, my daughters. I'd rather you go back to sinful Moab than to have to take care of you. Ouch. Send her away, for she crieth after us. That's what they said about that woman from the Syrophoenician woman to Jesus. Get rid of her. She cries after us. We don't want her as a ministry. And at the outset, Naomi looked at Ruth as if she were a curse. Now you'll have to go back and, and, and get a hold of and understand this whole story to understand as she's, as she's going through this processing in her life, she's starting to look at everything like a curse. But in chapter number 2, we notice and we consider, if you will, whereby she's not a liability anymore, she's an asset. And now she's helped her. This perceived liability down the road becomes comfort and help to her. I know some things are troublesome and I know some circumstances you and I don't like and they're difficult and they seem like a liability and the first thought that we have is, I want to get rid of this. Can you relate to her? Probably. But Ruth became an asset and it became a blessing to her. Hey, on, Naomi. Naomi, you're thinking about getting rid of her. Look at chapter number four for just a moment. Verse number 14, and the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not, left, uh, hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And, she, uh, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons that born him. Notice somebody else speaking to her and saying, this one woman's better than seven sons to you. Wow. Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became a nurse unto it. Hey, Naomi, you almost got rid of her. You tried, but she didn't let it happen. She pledged that she was going to go with you against your wishes. Now look at the benefit that at first you didn't want. Hmm. You ever been there? You ever been there before? After David killed Goliath, it got in Saul's mind that he was a a curse. Somebody that he didn't want around anymore. How do you get to looking at a David who killed Goliath for you and be somebody you don't want around anymore? You're in a bad place. You're in a bad place if you get to the point where you don't want God or the things that in your life anymore after all that God's done for you. You're in a bad place. 
And unfortunately for Saul in his life, he didn't have anybody to stand up to him to tell him that. Even his own son that tried, he pushed him away. We must learn to see and to seek the benefits of present hardship. It won't be easy to see unless you're looking for it. In fact, unless you wish, want, long, and desire to see the benefits in your hardship, you will be less likely to see it at all. Things are different when you put out the welcome mat. You say that this is in my life and it's inconvenient and I don't really like it, but it's here, so God must have allowed it. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep themselves unspotted from the world. That's what the Bible says. When the Bible says that we're to take care of widows and orphans, it did not say just take care of those that are trouble-free and easy to get along with and easy to deal with. But take care is all-encompassing. It comes in all shapes and all sizes. It comes in all difficulties and all hardships. Remember, thorns are without compassion. They're without mercy. Surgical in nature. Strategically placed to enhance a view of something difficult once it's accepted. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. His grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient, he says. Can I say that that's true in every situation? God gives it almost like a Anesthesia. You ever have an operation without anesthesia? No. Say amen for that. It's the same way with regards to troubles and hardships that come to our life. God is the one controlling the anesthesia of heaven. The grace of heaven. He knows how much you need and when you need it. He's controlling it to make sure that you don't feel too much pain. Even as you suffer a bit. Should we see these things as valuable or should we see them as burdensome? Something to be eliminated or something to keep? Go back one more time with me, if you would, to Acts chapter number 27. Are we doing all right so far? There'll be difficulties we're called to bear and loads we must carry. Because it pleases the Lord. Sometimes ministry will seem like a hardship. It will be a responsibility that we hope to shirk, avoid, deny. But we must be careful to never try to eliminate what God's put in place. Elimination is not the answer. The act of expelling or throwing off or the act of discharging or secreting by the pores. Notice, if you will, Acts chapter number 27 once again, and uh, verse number 18. And we being exceedingly tossed, what you think about that being not just physical, but I want you to think about it being spiritual. Exceedingly tossed with a tempest. And when you're in a tempest, you don't know which direction you're going. The next day, they lightened the ship. They lightened the ship. Look at verse number 38 in this passage of Scripture. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and they cast out the wheat into the sea. I want you to notice, because they eliminated the inconvenient, not realizing it at the time, next they would also be eliminating their cargo. That was their reason or their purpose for sailing in the first place. 
And then in verse number 19, the Bible says that they cast out the tackling of the ship. So the next thing that they get rid of is their gear and their equipment that helped them to sail. Uh, that was also what provided for their future blessings. Then they got rid of their food supply. And then lastly, the people. They distanced themselves from the ship altogether. The ship was no more valuable. In fact, it broke upon the rocks. It makes me wonder if the ship owner went bankrupt. Some decisions are more costly than others. His original purpose for sailing never made its destination. He never got paid. I want you to consider the issue of Miss Erica. She's seen as a, a bothersome problem to be eliminated rather than a ministry to be embraced. So there's now talk about putting her in a nursing home. I understand that they've been praying about it. And as they pray, they seem to be making some plans. Apparently, they now see that that's the best option for her. Is it? Yet I'm sure they are also probably see it as the best option for them. They feel those at the nursing home can better take care of her. At least they hope so. And at the exact same time, they make her somebody else's problem so that she's not their problem. What should they do? Perhaps you see ministry that way. Perhaps you see missions that way. Perhaps you see soul winning that way and outreach like they see Miss Erica. In part, we know that it's a biblical, a biblical obligation and a responsibility that's been given to us as we realize that she is theirs. Perhaps we've tried at some level to take care of missions, and at least if we've watched others verbalize the difficulty and caring for missions and the Great Commission as it should be cared for properly. Perhaps you've tried to take care of missions to some degree as they have tried to take care of Miss Erica. Somewhat. And now they're just thinking that she just needs to go away. They just put her in a home. Make her somebody else's responsibility. We've tried to take care of her, but put her in a nursing home. She's become too bothersome and too difficult. Is that the solution? Should we just put missions in the nursing home? Let somebody else take care of missions? Or do we want the responsibility? I mean, come on, we don't want the responsibility of this. It's bothersome. People don't want to be saved anymore anyways, do they? Come on. Every time you witness to them, they say things back to you. Just like Miss Erica, whenever somebody prepares her meal, she, she throws it back in their face. I don't want this. We don't want the responsibility. We don't want the bill. One of the good things about putting her in a nursing home is it'd be the government. So they can take, it'd be on them now. We don't want the bill for missions. It's easy to just uh, eliminate the inconvenient. What should they do? What will they do? Do you see missions and ministry? There's a wonderful privilege that's been given to us. Or do you see it as a burden that's inconvenient? It's just too hard to pass out tracts. It's just too hard to tell somebody about Jesus. It's just too hard to do that. Just let somebody else. I tell you what, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses will do it. When you consider eliminating and lightening the ship, Make sure you throw out or lighten and eliminate the carnal things and the earthly things, not the spiritual things. Maintain the spiritual things. Maintain the eternal things. Don't get rid of and lighten the ship of the wrong things. Burdensome? 
she can be, Ms. Erica, she's, she's, uh, she's kind of bothersome. One of the people that called me was talking to me about it. It stuck in my head, the Lord stuck in my head this, menace, this uh, message, said that it wasn't commodious. It's not convenient. It's not suitable. We don't want it anymore. Can I say to you the reason that the church suffers so greatly from birth or rebirth is because those who have been birthed see it as an inconvenience to help others with their rebirth. Come on now. Somebody else's responsibility. Let the pastor take care of it. Let the few little you know, people over here, man, a few excited people in the church about missions do it. Or, let the evangelist do it. Let somebody else do it. We don't want it. It's inconvenient. So let's just eliminate it. What purpose do you have of being here if you eliminate it? What purpose do we serve if we're not serving Christ and His glory? There's worship in heaven over the one. You want to be a part of the worship? In heaven, and get busy with the one, two, three. When it was not commodious, the more part advised, let's just get rid of missions altogether. Stand with me if you would tonight. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed for just a moment. Sister, you play softly for us. Maybe just talk to God a little bit. Someone wants to come and use the altar, you can't. I'm certainly mindful that maybe we reconsider lightening our ship. Let's not lighten our ship of the wrong things. The eternal things. If we're going to lighten our ship of something, let's lighten it of the earthly things, the temporal things, the carnal things. And let's give God our best. you take some time and pray?